Previously, I'm Mr. Referee's Nature Hood. outside, I'm feeling very warm. That's because my body has been burning a lot of calories. First, we're going to have to know a little bit about metabolism. Metabolism is basically when we convert our, our food into useful energy. Some of that energy is heat. And so by consuming more calories and being active, we actually produce more body heat. And then if we have a layer to capture that heat, um, we'll be just fine in the, in the coldest of winter weather. Mammals and birds are warm-blooded. They have to keep their body temperature within a certain range. Otherwise, they die. For example, humans can only increase in temperature about 5 degrees or decrease in temperature about 5 degrees. Otherwise, we're toast. Birds can either migrate south to warmer temperatures or stick around here in the winter. But they're going to need to be well insulated, have some place for shelter, and have plenty of food. Let's look at insulation. Both hair and feathers work by capturing tiny pockets of air, and air is a great insulator. In birds, they have feathers, and the smaller feathers are called down. Down is extremely insulating. In fact, we use it in our coats and jackets all the time. Now, yeah. take a look here. On my jacket, I see a little feather sticking out. Here we go. There it is. A little hard to see, but that's a, that's a piece of down that came from a bird. And now my jacket's a little less warm. Uh, an animal like a wolf, it'll have two types of hair. It has the guard hairs, which are the longer hairs. Uh, it's, they're a little tougher, more protective than the underfur. Uh, they shed water nicely to keep the underfur from uh, getting wet. Then the underfur is a really good insulation. That's kind of the fluffy fur. Some breeds of dogs have both types of hair, and some only have one type. Uh, the, and that might make your dog a little fluffier than a wolf, or your dog's hair might be similar to a wolf. Like a cocker spaniel, has long, silky guard hairs and a thick undercoat. And in the spring, Stella here will be shedding some of that undercoat. So they grow it very thick in the winter time and they shed it in the summer when they don't need it. I like to play with Stella's hair. I just realized I never explained the title of our show today, thermoregulation. So therm means heat, as in thermos or thermometer, and regulation just means to control. So our bodies, animals' bodies, regulate their heat. 
Now, before we head out on our next adventure, I'm going to put a little fuel in the tank. I need to take in some food so I can burn those calories. That'll help keep me warm in the wintertime. And I find that a summertime salad just doesn't do it for me. Give me some leftover chicken pot pie with its chunky pieces of chicken, its rich gravy, and buttery crust. That seems to satisfy me quite a bit better in the wintertime. Mm -mm. Adding fuel to the tank. Time to head out on our next adventure. We'll be going to Crosby Lake. It's a short distance from here, and it's along the Mississippi River Valley floodplain, and it's a great place for wildlife. All right, time to head out. Well, students, it's a beautiful day here at Crosby Lake on the Mississippi floodplain in St. Paul. And we're going to do a little exploring and seeing and see what types of signs of animals we can find. A lot of times in winter, you might not see the animal, but you'll see where they've been or where they might live. Well, straight ahead of me is an eagle's nest. And I knew that was here. And I fully expected to tell you that the eagles this time of year will have gone south, at least as far as Red Wing or Wabasha, where there's some open water for them to hunt. Uh, they're fish eaters. But it looks to me like there's an eagle sit sitting there on the nest. So it's not laying eggs, but it's probably got a nice place to just hang out. And I'm assuming it's going to be flying over to the Mississippi River to do its hunting. We'll see if we can get a closer look. There's a second eagle up in that tree as well. You can see the white. Here it comes. There's this little area that stays open. It must be a little stream of water that enters the lake there. It's a nice little open area for ducks too. They really just need some open water. They're well protected with their feathers from the cold. And if they have open water, they can find food. A former Woodbury Middle School student sent me a picture of an animal that was sitting at the edge of this little uh, open area. It looked to me like a muskrat. From a distance, both beaver and muskrat can look very similar. Let me do a little poking around and see if we can deduce which one it is more likely to be. There are signs of beaver on the lake. For example, here's a place I found where the beavers were working on a tree last summer. Let's take a look at the lodge for some more clues. These things are huge. This lodge doesn't look like it's been used in quite some time. The ends of the branches are discolored and I see no signs of recent repairs, and it's sort of falling apart. An active beaver lodge is a really interesting place. It has plenty of room for the whole family and easy access to a cache of food that they've stored underwater. On this lake, there might be as many as 15 or 20 different muskrat lodges. You can see this is much smaller than the beaver lodge. Muskrats only get to be a couple of pounds, two or three pounds in size, whereas an adult beaver could be 40, 50, or even 60 pounds. All of these plants over here sticking out of the water are cattails, and mostly this is cattails and mud. Now I'm going to take you back in time to the last time I was here at the uh, lake before this four inches of snow fell. We'll have a better look at how these things are constructed. So here we go, back into time. Going back into time. Muskrat make their homes out of cattails and other vegetation and mound it up and it freezes nice and solid. But inside here above the water line, there are probably a, there's a family of muskrat. And they're protected from their predators. They have food under the water. They eat the roots of uh, aquatic plants. On a nice day, they'll have openings in the ice that they plug with vegetation so that they don't freeze. Uh, Muskrats are air breathers, and when they're swimming around under the ice, feeding, they'll need to come up for air. 
they make openings in the ice that they'll plug with plant vegetation so it doesn't freeze. And then they have a nice little breathing hole they can come up to whenever they need to. It's called a muskrat push-up, and I was really excited to see my first one. That is so cool, I've never found one of those before. Thermoregulation in cold-blooded animals is a whole other thing. Their temperature range can be all the way from 100 degrees in warm weather down to near freezing in cold weather. Now there are some cold-blooded animals that are active in the winter time, but you're not going to find these out in the woods or up in the trees. Nope, these ones are going to be found under the ice. And to learn more about that, we're going to meet up with a friend of mine. You may know him up on Centerville Lake. Let's check it out. Underneath uh, the lake, it's not just all the same. I noticed that there are places where people have their uh, uh, fishing shacks and they must know there must be more fish in those areas. How, so how do you know where to make your hole? So uh, fish like anywhere where it transitions. So the bottom of the lake is never completely flat. And right here is a beach. So in the summertime, this is usually filled with people swimming and it drops off right about where we are from sand from the beach to out here is deeper water. It gets to about 17 feet deep and there's mud and weeds on the bottom. And the fish like to hang out where it switches from sand to mud and anytime where there's a change in the depth of the lake. And so what we can, we can see on these maps, those lines each indicate one foot of depth. So each time that, that the next line goes, that's getting one foot deeper of water. And the red spot is where we are right now? Yep. And so we're almost to where it's deep enough, huh? Yep, we got a little ways to go. All right, so today we're going after crappies, and crappies are a fish that like to hang out in schools. They're a schooling fish, and so right now, they could be spread out anywhere around here. So when we fish for crappies, I'm gonna drill a bunch of holes, kind of in a grid pattern, and then we'll just go around and we'll see if we can find them. So this tool called a sonar picks up my bait and picks up any fish. So if you can see right here, this is the top of the water where it says zero and the bottom is the red. So that's bouncing uh, sound waves off of the bottom of the lake. And so as I drop down, you can see as I lift up and down, that is, that is the bait that I'm using and the hook that I'm using. And we'll see if there's any fish on the bottom. Fish are almost always on the bottom. Let's see, oh, there looks like there might be a fish gonna come up here, let's see. Okay, the fish is almost on it. It's right on it right now. Nope. I really so, lift it up a little bit. They like to feed, always feeding going upward. Fish like to see what's above them and they feed coming upwards. So, Mr. Olufsen, um, before all this technology out here on the ice, how did people manage to catch any fish? So I remember as a kid, and so before we had this, you pretty much put a weight on the line and put it all the way to the bottom, and then would always reel up two or three times and let it sit a little bit off the bottom, and the fish will come and bite just and the same as they would there. you'd feel it on your line or on your yep. pole. Yep. It lets you know if the fish are there, but you still have to catch them. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, how about uh, before there was a GPS? How would a person know where to put their uh, hole or their house? And I suppose um, if you knew what the lake was like in the summertime, if you're familiar with the lake, you know where the, all the Yep, and they sell maps. Are. You can buy maps that have the contours on them. Okay. Uh, that's, really, that's a good way to, to know. And that every lake in Minnesota has, it has the contour map. It has what fish are in the lake. And they also their survey data from the fish that they've caught, the DNR have caught. Now it's actually a big advantage for fish to be cold-blooded at, at this time of year. Their body temperatures are the same as their environment, and that means that their metabolism, the rate at which their cells process food, slows way down. So they don't need to eat as often. 
Makes it a little tricky for a fisherman though, because a lot of times the fish aren't interested in their bait. You have to know your fish behavior and your lake, and you have to have a lot of patience. But Mr. Olofsson has caught up to 40 or 50 fish in one outing. If you're lucky, you'll have a lot of action out on the lake. Keep going, Chloe. Keep going, you got it, keep going. Oh, that's a big one, Chloe. Woohoo, doggy! Look at that, that's a slabber. Chloe, you did it. I did it. Yeah, buddy.